When it comes to your health and being, it can sometimes be really challenging to pick apart some of the different things that are going on. This is even more true when you have something like mold toxicity going on. And it turns out that mold can be a driver towards neurological symptoms that can cause anxiety, which then winds up putting a completely different diagnosis on what's going on. And so today I am absolutely delighted to be talking with Tracy Potter, who is a functional health anxiety detective, and we are going to be diving deep into the anxiety mold connection. Tracy, thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to talk about mold and anxiety. <laughs> what a fun topic. I know, right? It's crazy to think about it. I think there are probably more people who either have anxiety and don't realize there's underlying mold or have mold and don't realize that they can be dealing with anxiety as well. That the anxiety is um, associated with the mold, right? It's been caused yeah, by it. Yeah, absolutely. But before we dive into that, can you share just a little bit of your fascinating background with us? Okay. Well, my fascinating background is it's twofold. One, I was raised as the daughter of a psychiatrist. So I was raised in conventional medicine and I would help out at his office and he would take me to see patients like an emotional support kid. So I grew up in that world thinking that all mental health issues were just some genetic chemical imbalance that you could only treat with meds and maybe therapy. And then that, those are your options. If that didn't work too bad. <laughs> and so then my doctorate is in medical anthropology. I did a joint program with UCSF Medical School and UC Berkeley. I was actually on the UC Berkeley side, but we had that joint program with UCSF. And a lot of people don't know what medical anthropology is, but anthropology is the study of humans. So there's social and cultural anthropology where you look at different cultures and backgrounds and like really understand that the reality we create is in our minds. So a lot of you may know that from like meditation or spiritual practices, but we invent our reality with our consciousness. And so different cultures do it differently. So I was fascinated with that. But I also, as I started having some of my own health issues, I actually accidentally lost 50 pounds moving to Spain and living there a couple of years. And I was like, after trying all these diets that never worked. And that started me realizing like, this is a cultural issue. This isn't like, I'm, I just thought it was genetic because there was so much obesity in my family. So I realized that, that wasn't true. And another thing was, I just, yeah, I just was, my mom had gotten Crohn's disease and I actually was already in medical anthropology and I was interested in how in healing across different cultures. I was really interested in things like really exotic things like shamanism and indigenous belief systems and things. I, I felt like we we were pinched off from something in our history, like some something about our basic humanness or some kind of ancient wisdom that in the modern world we were cut off from it. So I was really fascinated with how is industrialized culture affecting indigenous people? Because I was actually really concerned about them because I just kept reading all this research that when they start living like us, they develop the same diseases, they end up with the same mental health issues. Just, I was just like, I don't know. I just felt so sad about that. And I felt like, we, why aren't we learning from them? Why are we making them like us? Why aren't we learning from them? Mm. And so that, that kind of turned me into, so medical anthropology is a study of like how we deal with birth, life, death, illness across different cultures. And it, it also involved a lot of politics of knowledge, like how the medical systems, how money drives decision making, how scientific research is often skewed to get the results that the investing <laughs> corporation or whatever wants to get to back their claim or send the message to the public that they're trying to get out. And so I just realized that my fantasy of this science being there being this one kind of neutral objective science was a facade and that's not really how it works so that was a long answer but basically this is i eventually got into functional health because my own health struggles and a huge part of that was mold not surprisingly and then it was compounded with other things and not just mold i got lead poisoning lime exposure mm -hmm. things like that cool. so, yeah and so i basically can't turn off my anthropology brain. I can't stop thinking like an anthropologist when I work with people. So I got into functional health because of my own healing trajectory, like so many of us. And um, now I combine my anthropological background with functional health to help people find the hidden causes of their anxiety. Mm. And 
I find it interesting. First of all, I, I think that's really an amazing story and how fascinating for you to be able to see that shift that happens when we change location and the things that it does to us. I, I will say, I'm sure you'll agree, anxiety is pretty much everywhere around the world. It's not like right. there's any culture that does not ever experience right. it. Right. It's anxiety. universal. It's but nature's I, smoke alarm. <laughs> oh, I love that. Oh, I'm yeah. It's how nature down. says something's wrong. I need help. Something's wrong. I need help. And then we're like, let's just take the battery out of the smoke alarm so it'll stop making that obnoxious noise. So it'll stop feeling bad. And then if your house is actually on fire, it'll still burn down. Yeah. So that's why I'm telling people like anxiety is trying to tell you something. And sometimes the smoke alarm goes off and there isn't a real fire. There's just you know, over heated. There's some smoking oil in your kitchen or whatever. That's I'll try not to abuse the metaphor, but there's a reason. And I always say that anxiety is an extension of nature's genius of nature's intelligence. It's a message that we need nurture. There's a, mm -hmm. it's letting us know something's off and it's, if it were a genetic um, defect, like a genetic chemical imbalance, then pretty much 70% of humans are defective, right? Because yeah. so many people struggle at some point in their life with anxiety, like 20% of people have diagnosed conditions that are being treated. And that's just the diagnosed official people. That's a small per percentage of overall people there. There are a lot of different studies that get different numbers, but some around 40% of people struggle with anxiety to the extent it debilitates their life. And, and then there's 70% of people are so stressed and overwhelmed that, which is on the spectrum of anxiety, right? That it's affecting their life. And most people at some point in their life are going to deal with anxiety, not just situational anxiety. Like I'm going to give a speech or my mom's sick, but where it's, it's interfering with your life quality in a day-to-day -day way. And also just one more thing is that whole genetic chemical imbalance. I understand that people were saying chemical balance to try to make it simple to the public to explain like neurotransmitters and biochemistry and things like that. But I want to say every illness is a chemical imbalance because we're made of chemicals. If you have diabetes, that's a chemical imbalance because glucose and insulin are chemicals. Leptin is a chemical, right? So we all have chemical imbalances if we have any health issues. And that's such a good point because our body runs on these chemicals and these hormonal interfaces. I right. think one of the things that happens though, unfortunately, is a lot of times if people report symptoms of anxiety, stress, whatever, frequently it tends to be dismissed. And I think it's also perhaps sometimes not included in the mix when we have something else going on, such as mold toxicity. Right. There seems to be this growing epidemic of mold these days that I keep hearing more and more about it, different kinds of mold, different situations where mold is coming up. Can you talk about the impact that mold has on the neurological system and how that can in turn exacerbate anxiety? Yes, absolutely. And then there's some, if you would like me to, I can also touch on why I think mold is becoming a worse and worse problem. I would love um, that. Okay. So remind me to do that. <laughs> so <laughs> let's put a pen in that. Okay. So mold toxins, it's a little complex and I'm, you know, I'm trying, I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible, but mold toxins are neuroinflammatory. That means they cause inflammation of the brain and nervous system. So I teach mm -hmm. people the word neuroinflammation. Neuro is for neurology, like brain and nervous system. And uh, inflammation is inflammation, right? It's an immune response of your body trying to protect you. Mm -hmm. And so mold is a poison to our nervous system. It's mm -hmm. a neurotoxin, meaning it's a poison to our brain and nervous system. And so it's actually used, mold toxins are actually used to suppress the immune system, to make medications that suppress the immune system for organ transplant um, recipients. So it suppresses your immune system. And then now you're susceptible to all kinds of other infections, parasites, Epstein-Barr virus, different herpes, cytomegalovirus, whatever. So now your immune system suppressed. And then also your immune system and your nervous system are in lockstep. So we talk about where our language, we you talk about them like they're separate. But for example, your vagus nerve, longest nerve in the body, I think it's becoming very more and more mainstream to know what your vagus nerve is and how it helps calm you down, regulate your nervous system. Guess what? Your nervous, your vagus nerve also regulates cytokine storms, which we learned about during COVID. And it basically, your nervous system helps regulate or balance your immune system and your immune system when you get symptoms 
or then that will tell your nervous system you're not safe. And so they get caught in these limbic system loops and autonomic nervous system loops. You get caught in these loops of nervous system. I'm not safe body. Let's protect you nervous system. I'm being protected with painful symptoms. I'm not safe. And the nervous system is like, okay. We'll protect you more. And so you get caught in these loops that you can get sicker and sicker. So now you're in this loop of you're totally stressed out. Your immune system's gone like on hyperdrive. But in other ways, your immune system has been suppressed. So your immune system has these different components to it that do different things. So in some ways, you're in this inflammatory response, you're having brain fog, you're having body aches and pains and muscle and joint pain, weird hormonal things, skin things, like it just goes on and on. Mm -hmm. And then you're having all these symptoms of the damage from the mold, but your own immune system's reaction to the mold. And then at the same time, in other ways, your immune system suppressed. So now you're left open to other kinds of infections. And so then you end up in these complex syndromes and then you get the idea. A lot of people don't want to find out if they have mold sickness because they hear such horrible things. It seems like something you can never heal from and that it's going to ruin your life. So if I don't know I have it, then I won't have it. Right. <laughs> ostrich, ostrich syndrome. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the truth is that's not the truth is that's not true. You can actually heal mold sickness, but you just have to do it a very certain way so that you can disentangle yourself. But one of the things I want people to understand is your nervous system plays such a huge role in it. You can't just take binders and detox and whatever and not deal with your nervous, your neuroimmune response. There's another word, mm -hmm. neuroimmune, the nervous system and the immune system, how they work together. That's a hybrid word. So if you don't deal with the neuroimmune component, then you'll be stuck in this for a long time. So mold, to recap your question, mold is a poison to the brain and nervous system. So anything that causes inflammation in the brain, the gut is going to cause symptoms because anxiety is how your brain says, ouch, mm -hmm. depression, brain fog, fatigue. These are all ways your brain says, ouch, the same way if you put your hand on a hot stove and you're like, ouch, that hurts. Or you bump your elbow and you're like, ouch, that hurts. Your body has to let you know when you're hurt so it can get what it needs. And if we tell our body, I hate you telling me something's wrong. I'm just going to make you shut up. <laughs> and we yeah. don't actually deal with the underlying cause. Then our bodies are trying to protect us. And I remember feeling when I was first having really bad health problems, I felt betrayed by my body. Mm -hmm. I felt defective and broken. And, yeah. and it was so painful to feel that way. And so one of the things I want to get out to people, you are not defective. You are not broken. This isn't just some genetic disorder. Even if you have some genetic mutations that make you more susceptible to mold or make you struggle with detox, you're not a broken, defective person. You can heal. And yeah, it's just, it's just having to have the right guidance to get you on that path. And I also want to add one more layer to that, which is that in the process of dealing with all of that inflammation, we also need to make sure that we are nourishing the body. Yes. And so that goes on a much deeper oh, gosh, level. Yes. Unfortunately, mainstream medical typically tends to avoid that. They don't cover that, or they tend to be dismissive, perhaps if you have this weird variety of symptoms and they're like, well, your tests are fine. That can be problematic because perhaps there is underlying anxiety or some other things that are going on. Can we talk about that sort of hidden silent epidemic that's ignored right. by mainstream? Yeah. Medical? I call them the mystery illnesses. Sometimes we call them chronic complex illnesses, but they're the ones that aren't taught in medical school. So the doctors don't know what to do. You talk to any humble, honest, open-minded physician, which I have a lot of friends and clients that are those people. And they will tell you they're not taught about environmental sickness in medical school. It may be a paragraph in a book like that they mm -hmm. skim over. There aren't really strong pharmaceutical interventions that are highly profitable for these things. And so it's just, it just gets skipped over. But what they can do is like, oh, I'm having anxiety. We'll put you on antidepressants or benzos. I'm having trouble sleeping. We'll put you on Ambien. I'm having aches and pains all over my body. We'll put you on pain meds. I have it. And then what do you think is going to happen? Do you think that's going to fix the dysregulated nervous system and mold toxicity that's like damaging the cells of your body that's accelerating your aging? And then my favorite thing to get mad about, one of them, is when like when I recently got 
in the couple, like two and a half years ago, I had been re-exposed. I've been in a house with peeling lead paint. So I got lead poisoning. And then I, I currently live in Hawaii. I'm actually moving to Colorado, but basically there was, there's always mold in Hawaii. <laughs> there's 85% humidity in your house. And even with the most perfect person, you can't see it, but you can run an army test. You can do a genetic testing on the, the dust in your house. And, and it's just, no matter what I do, it's going to be pretty high. So yeah. I, now I do help people with their nervous system response and their immune response so they can live. I help people keep their mold down and get their reaction to the mold to, to balance so they can stay if they want, but it's still more work in a human environment, right? If you're sensitive, but what ended up happening was I was, I got the lead poisoning. So that hypersensitized me to the mold because these things all play together. And then so when I was, I suddenly my vision just, I went from perfect vision within a period of like a month to having like a lot of vision loss. Wow. And so I go, go to an ophthalmologist and he's, that's just your age. And you go to, you go to endocrine, whatever you go to different doctors, like trying to get some help with what's happening to me because I was so sick. I was so sick. My kidneys were literally failing. Because oh. mold and lead both poison your kidneys. They cause horrible yeah. body pains. What I probably would have been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, which I call the F word diagnosis or the crazy lady disease. And, so, and I can't tell you how many people tried to tell me it was my age. When I mm. had urine tests showing I had high mold, I had, and I would show it to them. And I had, I had done photography of the whole house of the peeling paint, the lead test kits. Like I had, I was showing them, I have lead poisoning. I have, I'm like showing them, this is what's wrong with me. I just need some support monitoring my vitals while I try to heal this. And they still were just like, everything's fine. You're fine. Or it's just your age. That's just your age. That's just perimenopause. Wow. That's so challenging. I, and the thing is, I, I think anytime you have any kind of a chronic health issue, whether it is mold or some sort of autoimmune disorder or some sort of neurological dysregulation or anything like that, it tends to be so isolating that at a certain point, right. it's very difficult to yes. continue to advocate for yourself because everybody is. is telling like, you you're crazy. Yeah. You can't see the picture from inside the frame. So I was trying to get help, even though I have training in this I needed help managing my own case because you can't manage your own case. That's not, you're like, I was literally like, felt like I was dying. I literally was dying and my body was fighting to live. And then having to be my own case manager, that was awful. And I finally was able to find some people, some colleagues to help, but it was awful. And one of the things that I want to really bring voice, if you've struggled with, whether it's mental health issues and you don't know what's causing it, or, and by the way, never assume it's just genetics. Everyone's family has mental health issues, some more than others, but I promise you, it's not just like purely some genetic thing, I promise. But mm -hmm. a lot of people who have mental health issues and or have mold, you get treated like you're crazy. Mm -hmm. So it ends up happening. And I've experienced this personally, and I've seen it happen with clients. And I, I'll be honest, one day I was at some hot springs in California. I'm like relaxing in the hot tub. And this woman comes up to me, asks what I do. I tell her. And suddenly she's like pouring her whole case history at me. And she's super accelerated and talking really fast and just like really agitated and really emotional and all over the place. And I'm just like, ah, it was a lot. I'm like, I'm on vacation. <laughs> like, we're not. I'm just here console. to relax. Yeah. And there was something me. I was like, oh, this is why doctors, when people come in like that with they're all their chronic health things and they're all super activated or whatever. They just want to go like this. I'm like, here, I'll just send you to psych. I'll just send you to a psychiatrist, get you some meds and just get you out of my office. And, but when you're on the receiving end of that, it's devastating. So I want to say, even if you are that person, you've been that person. I, and I've also been that person, like where I'm just so sick and I'm emotional and like I'm just scared and, and desperate and sad and I don't feel heard and, and my body's falling apart and my mind's going crazy because my brain is poison and I need help. And I know the answer is not psych meds. And I'm not saying, let me, I always say this disclaimer every time I speak, if you're on psych meds, I'm not here to judge you. If that's going to keep your head above water so you can do what you need to do to heal, just don't stop there. It's like, you don't stay on crutches and keep a cast forever. After you break your leg, you heal it and you support the body's healing. And then you remove the cast, you get rid of the crutches. And so 
I just, psych meds are really meant to be temporary. They're often really not even necessary, but if it's something that you found use in or whatever, I'm like, I don't have a judgment about it. Just make sure it's not causing worse side effects than what you're trying to treat. And certainly so, don't um, ever stop cold turkey. And like, never stop cold turkey. Done, oh my gosh, yes, thank you for saying that. Yes, never, provision. ever. In yeah. fact, I, I'm i not an MD, so I can't tell people what to do with their meds, but I really highly, I do patient advocacy and education and I educate people to really like consider talking to your doctor about weaning at half the rate mm -hmm. that the drug companies recommend. And this is going to sound like a conspiracy theory, but I, and my background in medical anthropology, we looked at so much like how policy is shaped by financial motivation. It's just human nature. And if you look at the rate at which people are recommended to come off their meds by the pharmaceutical industry, that rate almost guarantees some kind of rebound where you will be so like symptomatic that you will want to get back on the meds and not get off of them. Mm. So, because there, what's the economic incentive to get off the meds? There isn't one. There isn't one. And so sure. that may or may not be true, but I just, my experience has been, especially with highly sensitive people and whether you were before mold or not, once you've been exposed to mold, you become a highly sensitive person really weaning off meds very slowly is super important for your emotional safety. So I always tell people you need to, if you're, you're using this as a support, you're using the meds as a support. You can't just pull the rug out from under yourself. You have to bring in nutrition, self-care, sleep. We can use a lot of functional health tools to support. Now you're being held. Now you're getting better. Now you're healing. And then you don't need the meds anymore. And then they can fall away gently and gradually. Never just pull the rug out from under yourself suddenly. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Cause I think for many people, they either don't like the long-term side effects or there are other things that happen from that. And I agree that adding in all the functional supports is huge because most of us don't get enough of that in the first right. place. Right. But I, I want to go back for a second because you said, let's talk about why there's so much more mold going on. I would love to know your thoughts on that. Yeah. Okay. So I think it's, it's multi-directional. So on one hand, one thing I've heard, I haven't found like just total evidence that this is true. If I don't know if you have, I would love someone to point me in the right direction, but I've heard different people like speaking on mold, say there's this theory that mold has gotten more toxic because you know how we have super bugs. We're using so many antibiotics that we've created yeah. these super bugs, this antibiotic resistant bacterial strain. So there's this theory that by using this kills like, or whatever brand indoor anti mold killing paint primer, that it's basically creating this, these breeds of super mold that are like extra toxic and resistant. So I don't know if that's actually true, but I think it's an interesting um, hypothesis and I would love if someone has any evidence of that or whatever, I would love to know. So that's, but in some way it could be that there's more mold. And we're also using like in Hawaii, their houses should not be built out of wood in a tropical environment. That just makes no mm -hmm. sense. It should be like cement or rock or stone or something mold doesn't love to chomp on. So <laughs> that's that we're not, we're not, our housing isn't adapted to our environment in a lot of cases. And then what's happening, for example, in Arizona, that's an example of a place that's very dry and people assume there's no mold there, but people get a lot of mold in their HVAC systems and their air conditioning systems mm -hmm. because there's so much heat outside. And then they turn on the AC inside and it creates this condensation of moisture in the air conditioning ducts and then mold grows in the AC ducts and, and buildings. And so people end up like breathing in mold and they can't see it in their house. It's coming, blowing out of the AC. Some people can smell it. Yeah. Some people can't. That's one angle. Also Sorry, yeah, go ahead. I was oh, just you saying, go ahead. I've heard also that we are building houses tighter and tighter. And so that's not supposedly not helping either because yeah, with airflow to breathe as well as humans. And also the darkness, like sunlight kills mold. So if we're in, like, if you have more sunlight, more ventilation, and then, yeah, and then it, regulating the humidity and that, that kind of thing, or if you make it too cold and if it's hot outside and you want your AC to be 60 degrees and it's 110 outside, like that mm -hmm. contrast, like not wanting to be a little warm or whatever can cause um, more of that. So that's just like more on the molds, the existence of mold side of things. But where I really think we have even more control is on this other side of what's happening to the human immune system. 
-hmm. And this is tied to the nervous system and it's tied to the microbiome and just the way we're living. So we're immune resilience and neurological resilience go together. So when we are taking antibiotics at earlier and earlier ages, Mm -hmm. we're, we're making the immune, like our microbiome is not just bacteria, it's bacteria, viruses, protists, amoebas, like worms. There are all kinds of, I call them critters because I think it's more fun. And so, so there are all these critters that live in and on us, not just in our gut, but skin, vagina, sinuses. It's just everywhere. We're more microbial than human, right? Or yeah. as microbial as human. And so as we're like just imbalancing our microbiome through overuse of antibiotics, when there are so many herbal antimicrobials that are as effective or more for a lot of everyday things. Now, if you have sepsis or you're going to lose an organ, you're going to die of infection, go for the antibiotics and clean up the mess later (laughs) best you can. But there's so many things that people go straight to antibiotics because they're not aware of how effective certain herbs are for killing all kinds of things. And what's interesting is these plants evolve immune systems that tend to create compounds that don't damage their own beneficial microbes, which Mm -hmm. tend to be ours too. So there's this intelligence of nature, this nature's genius in these plants, immune systems that we're borrowing when we take herbs, right? So anyway, so we're decimating our microbiomes with overuse of antibiotics, sugar feeding, you feed the wrong, there's tests we do in stool tests. We look at your firmicutes to bacterioidetes ratio, and we can tell how many bacteria do you have that are like the, we want simple feed on sugar and they make you crave sugar. And they also affect your metabolism, not just like in terms of what people think of carbs and weight gain, but they actually create hormonal changes that cause weight gain. Mm -hmm. So there's all these things we're doing with our lifestyle, not getting enough sleep, being super stressed out. We're also over bombarded with information. Now we're hearing the pain and trauma and torture of billions of people on the daily. And news is not the good news. If I were like a multi-billionaire, I would start a news network called the good news, <laughs> but we're hearing the bad news. So our nervous systems are bombarded with negativity. We're pressured to overachieve all the time and be perfect. We're taught to poison our bodies with the way we're eating. We're taught to give up sleep and sacrifice ourselves for our jobs or our families or for whatever. So we're taught to basically deprive ourselves of our most basic human needs. So many of us are alienated. We're not getting enough touch, enough sex, enough, like whatever. And, and then we're over sterilizing. We're so scared of microbes. So we're sterilizing everything to kill all the germs, but then we're poisoning ourselves with toxic chemicals. What do you think that does to our nervous system and our immune system? When we're taking all these neurotoxins and poisoning our brain and nervous system, what do you think that does to our immune system? What do you, you know what I'm saying? So, so, so- It sounds like this societal pressure, unfortunately, more news is not better. We, in the beginning, we were all excited. Like the internet happened to everyone was like, Ooh, this is great. Cause we have this sort of voyeuristic tendency as humans. We're We're curious. curious. No, yes. What's going on. And now it's gotten to the point where it's become like a fire hose. And so what I'm hearing from you is that it sounds like this, high level of over information, over stress, pushing in the wrong direction away from healthy habits, et cetera, is is a major contributor to underlying mental and physical illness. And then that sets us up for any infection, environmental toxin comes along and maybe Mm -hmm. our ancestors might've been able to swing handle it, but we can't because I love the term allostatic load. It's not a very sexy word though. So a lot of people use the metaphor of a bucket, like how much your body can handle. And when your bucket yeah. spills over, things start falling apart. Your body is tearing down faster than it can rebuild. And I also want to share that for, for people who are not familiar with that term, but like everybody's bucket is different. We have, have different- a human reset that says, oh, you, this is the load everybody should be able to take. Everybody has different capacity based on absolutely lived experience, genetics, exposure, all the yeah. things that you're yeah. doing. And so we, we yeah. are everybody, everybody's body is different. We do not yeah. all have that same yeah. load capacity. Yeah. We, yeah. we are bio individual. And yeah. so one of the things I say over and over again at the, at the risk of being really repetitive and predictable <laughs> is what my, what I want people to understand is you're not defective or broken. 
-hmm. We have normalized a toxic culture that tries to override nature and we're not living in the way we evolved to live and a lot of the ways we evolved to live. And this is putting levels of unprecedented levels of stress on our bodies and it's damaging our immune system. So we're having unprecedented levels of hypersensitivity, sensitivities to food, to environmental toxins, to mold, less and less ability to regulate like infections things like parasites, because before we would have certain bacteria and things and other like beneficial, we would, our immune systems would actually tolerate things like tapeworms. So one thing that I love that I think is interesting, I was listening to this interview, I think it was someone from Harvard microbiome medicine department. I can't remember for sure, but it was this fascinating interview. And they were talking about Yanomami people and how they were going out. And these are indigenous people in Brazil and how they were going into the rainforest and they were taking poop samples from these people and looking at how amazing their microbiomes were so diverse. Like they reflected the diversity of the Amazon jungle and they, and these people had all these things in their bodies that we call parasites, like in a bad way, but they were totally healthy teeth, healthy hearts, healthy skin. Like they were really healthy, mentally healthy, physically healthy people. And yet they had all these critters living in them that we would, if we, did a fecal transplant from one of those. It was funny, actually, as I'm listening to this, I'm like, that's it. I want a fecal transplant from my, from one of these people. And as soon as I had the thought that it, the person being interviewed said, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> 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 you want a fecal transplant. Well, guess what? You would get so sick. You would probably get dysentery. You could even die if you did that. So what's it's happening is our immune systems are becoming yeah. more and more yeah. restrictive of what they can tolerate. We're becoming very intolerant we're losing oral tolerance of foods. We're losing tolerance of like just being able to be exposed to different microbes. We have steril we're sterilizing ourselves to death. We're worrying ourselves to death. We're protecting ourselves to death. We're eating crap to death. We're sleep starving ourselves to death. And, and that's why I, I'm trying to get the message out to people that anxiety is nature's wake up call. Mm -hmm. This mental health epidemic is in, in the chronic health and mold and all in autoimmunity and all this stuff. This is nature's wake up call saying, please come back home to your yeah. humanness, come back home to mama nature, that you are this miraculous genius extension. I call my business inner genius health because we are, nature isn't outside of us. It's what we are. We, in all our symptoms, all our pain, all our struggles, it's nature calling us home to mm -hmm. ourselves. And the more we heed that call, if we keep going to all these synthetic molecules and chemicals and we try to, what is that? I don't remember the exact, Einstein quote about trying to solve the problem with the same thinking that created yeah. it. Yeah. When we are like, oh, I'm sick. So I'm going to go in a hospital and eat processed food while I'm being hooked up to all these like synthetic molecules and fluorescent lighting where no one lets me sleep. How are we supposed to heal? Now, there's a time to go to a hospital because I'm not saying there isn't, but it's if we just change our thinking and yeah. we start saying, play a game. How can I start live in the modern world, but start realigning with nature's rhythms? How can I start mm -hmm. resetting my circadian rhythms? How can I start like dimming the light at night, getting more sleep and taking better care, eating natural food? A lot of people are like, I hate cooking. That's a belief. You were, that was actually taught, started in the 1950s to teach because the. They wanted housewives to buy processed, processed food. food. As a matter of fact, there was a quote that if they did not teach all American housewives to buy packaged foods, then the FDA was not doing their job. I know, well, I'll like, have to find well, yeah. the exact quote. Yeah, and I know you know this, that the packaged food industry really took hold during the first two world wars. It was mainly for soldiers in the field. It wasn't really supposed to be what everyone was eating, but then it started growing as an industry and going to feed. The wives were like, it was mostly back then women at home trying to hold down the fort work the husbands were off at war and then raised the children. And so convenience foods got, and then when the second world war ended, they had to pivot. So now they're like, let's demonize cooking and shame it and make it sound like a waste of time. Well, and, an and part of it, truthfully, there's a really great book called the combat ready kitchen. And it talks about how so much of what we see at the grocery store and what we take for granted, including things as innocuous as Lunchables, got their start in providing service to the military. Right. Because 
They needed something that they could do. And then once that need was over, the company just invested how much money they're not going to let that go. They're going to exactly. figure out how to get that into the kitchen. Where do we think protein bars came from? Like people, protein bars, protein shakes got their start in MREs, meals ready to eat. From right. Yeah. I call energy bars, lethargy bars, because there's so much sugar. Yeah. They spike your sugar, yeah. crash your sugar, and right. give you lethargy. There you go. Yeah. So yeah, well, absolutely. So I, or, I, or the refined vegetable oil industry that was like uh -huh. first, they just, that vegetable oil was what people used to illuminate their houses, like for lamps and stuff. And then when electrification became universal, then they had to pivot and they weren't going to stop selling vegetable yeah. oil. So they started shoving it down our throats. I know I'm preaching the choir here. So yeah. So well, I, that's I feel part. like you, you and I could talk for an hour. Like, yeah. <laughs> we just, probably should re reel it in. You've shared so much amazing information and really help people gain a deeper understanding of how some of the pieces and parts are connected internally. And I know it's really challenging sometimes, especially if you're dealing with mold toxicity, chemical overload, any kind of chronic health issues, some sort of systemic imbalance. What is something that you think could be like a good starting point what is a one thing, a single step that someone could take to try yes, to get themselves that's back? That's a great home? question. And I have an answer. So like it can get so overwhelming to feel like, okay, I have to have this kind of diet and I have to do this and I have to do this and I have to do this. If your nervous system is dysregulated, mm -hmm. then it's going to be so hard to think about planning, cooking, seeing a practitioner, changing other lifestyle things. I want to invite you to just stop. This is something I actually was just at a conference with. I had mentioned Akash Gupta and we were both talking about, it, it was interesting because I hadn't really, I didn't really know anything about his program before. Mm -hmm. And there's a 95% overlap in our programs in a lot of ways, but he, he has an amazing program. And one of the things that we were talking about is how like you can't be focusing on the illness all the time. Because mm -hmm. then you're going to just stay in a loop. You're going to mm -hmm. stay in a loop. So what I really encourage people to do is just start with a morning 15 minute meditation. I do have one on my website. You can okay, do some, great. another one, energyneushealth.com. You could find another one. But the reason I, I chose this one to put on my website as a free gift is because this one helps you get back in your body. It helps with the physical pain. It helps stop physical pain. It helps stop the nervous system from spinning out. So it basically helps stop anxiety and calm you down. It helps lower and reduce pain. And it also helps if you, I, I recommend that people start doing, it only takes 15 minutes. I recommend people start in the morning, doing it in the morning, but also you can do it at bedtime. And it's something you can learn how to do. Once you've heard the recording a few times, you don't have to listen to it anymore. You know the method. And then once you know the method, you just, when you go to sleep at night, you can, as you're falling asleep, you can do this practice and you will be knocked out. Like I jokingly, but not jokingly like to call it better than melatonin. And then if you wake up in the middle of the night, you can do the practice and it'll knock you back out to sleep. Now, some people do have such severe nervous system dysregulation. They need more support around sleep and all that stuff. But sure. when you start just retraining your brain and nervous system to calm down, stop focusing on the pain, start just going, coming back home, come back home. That's what meditation is. It isn't stopping thoughts. It's not clearing your mind. It's coming home to yourself. It's coming back into your body, breathing, feeling. And this brain trick meditation that I teach you, it gives your mind something to do the whole time. So you're not, anyone can do it. People will say, I suck at meditation. I can't meditate. That is not true. You just haven't been given the tools to do it in a way where you can feel successful and have the kinds of blissful euphoric experiences that drive people to keep it as a lifelong practice. You just haven't learned yet. So this is a long rambly response, but I want people to understand, start with meditation, start with your nervous system, start with refocusing your attention to how you, the outcomes you want to have, how you want to feel and mm -hmm. not focusing your attention on the problem and the hopelessness and all of that. Once you start calming your nervous system, now you have space. You went from being like, uh, now you have space and you can breathe. Now you can eat better. Now you can start taking some of these other steps forward to nurture yourself. So just start with your nervous system first. Then as you have space, as you come back home to yourself, 
you can make some of these other changes. That sounds really great. So I will definitely put a link to that below. I feel like I could like talk to you. Yeah, as I know. I said for an hour. We yeah, definitely yeah. we're gonna we're gonna have to well, do for this for everyone again. else's sake. <laughs> let's wrap it up. I just want people to know if you have mold sickness, there are tools that mm-hmm. will actually help get rid of your anxiety and your mold sickness. Like you can overcome yeah. both of them and you can actually become increasingly less sensitive to mold where you don't have to live your whole life being like, is there mold? Is there mold? Is there mold? I smell mold. Do I smell mold? Is there mold? Uh, like you can get to a whole different place where you're just like, please don't, don't put a hex on yourself. Be yeah. careful going on these mold forums where everyone's hopeless and dysregulated and they're all feeding each other's yeah. fear. Be careful about yeah. that. Find people who've healed themselves or who know who've had a lot of success healing people and focus on that. Look for the open door, look through the path door. Don't look for the walls and the barriers and the dead ends. Look for the openings and there are plenty of openings and you can heal. I promise. That, that sounds great. It really does. And Tracy, it has been so wonderful to talk with you. Like I said, I think I'm going to have you back on. We're going to have to continue this conversation <laughs> and talk about some other fabulous things. But in the meantime, folks, be sure to check the comments down below. I will put the link to Tracy's website where you can get that free 15 minute meditation and some other links. I'll put her website, etc. And I really hope that you can take this information that you learn in order to begin taking those first steps to nurture yourself, take care of yourself and support yourself as you're dealing with whatever is going on. And as always, remember in all you do to make today a healthy day. Bye folks.